Kia all and welcome, the warmest and largest of welcomes to um, our Matadiki Pride panel today. Ko waio, ko Jess McLean Tokawinawa, he kaya hoao ki Aotei School of Aldi Indigenous Studies. Uh, Ingaari, before we go any further, I will uh, open with a karakia. So, uh, mi inui tātou. Tukua te wairua ki a redi, ki ngā taumata, hei ārahi i a tātou mahi, Meta tato fai na tikanga a rato ma, kia mo kia ita, kia koia e naro, kia pupuri, kia faka moa, kia tina. Tina. Huye tai e. Kia ora all with us, iti tinana, physically here in the room, and to those joining along Zoom. Um, let me get some housekeeping out of the way before we get the best of it started. Uh, so, in the event of Ruo Moko stirring or any other type of emergency, um, our exits are down the stairs and the assembly point is behind you all on the concrete bit out there. For Wharipaku uh, or toilets, these can be found at the other end of the building by the stairwell um, and the lifts. They are um, gender neutral, which I think is lovely and appropriate. Um, this has been recorded, just so everybody knows, we are um, live streaming it for those that can't be here and, and recording it as well. So for anyone that wants to participate in the question and answer bit, um, just to be mindful of that. So kia ora everyone, um, I might pass over to you. Oh, kia ora koutou, uh, kia ora koutou, ko tāme nei in person. This is the first time we've had an event in months and months where we actually have real people in the room and kia ora to you also who are beaming in to watch us. I have a bit of a tickler stroke. My most voice is not normally this husky. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty cool, but it's not really <laughs> uh, So thank you. This is the first that I've heard of having a talking about Matariki in a queer in the Takapapu context and what that might mean for us and and how we might develop that as the years go on. And so thank you for being here and being part of this. I want to uh, put out an apology. Part of this, the idea for this hui came from uh, my youth MP, the Hari um, Campbell Conia, who had this idea about how some of our atua had been misgendered. And we just kind of built on that. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that later, but he's had to be at the tangi back in Gisborne and could not attend. So I uh, just wanted to meet you to the amazing ideas that he has and we'll be able to develop that further later. So for today, Matariki. So the name, as we understand it, comes from after the separation of Rangi and Papa, and not all of the gods were happy with this, and particularly Tafari Mati Akaura Fuida, and he fought with all of his, apparently all brothers. I find it hard to believe that they're only men. Come on. So, yeah, <laughs> come on. Uh, however, as the story goes, but when it came to fighting with his brother, Tumata Winga, the god of war, seriously outclassed. And so he got in a huff and he threw his eyes up into the sky to his father. And so it's Nga Mata o Te Ariki Tapari Matia. So Mata Ariki, Mata Ariki. So that's where it comes from. And so, of course, I think Matariki is mostly known as a time of new beginnings, a time when the harvest is done. But there are also many other meanings to Matariki. And if any of you have a chance, I'm going to do a plug here. Rangi Mātāmua is one of, really, a, a leader in this kind of kōrero. His book, Matariki, the Star of the Year, this comes in English and you can buy it also in video. So it is a beautiful resource to have. 
uh, but he has a series of whakapauki in here, and so I wanted to read one of them because as, as Māori, we worked on the lunar calendar, and Matsuri here was a big part of that, so it guided our lives, how we ate, how we harvested, not just from the whenua and from the land, but also from our awa, from our moana. And but another key role, the eldest, the eldest daughter of Matariki, Puhutakawa, she was responsible for guiding the dead across the sky. And so could you find me page 97? So much for multitasking. Can't, hold, <laughs> can't open the book and hold the mic. <laughs> so yeah, ko matariki te kaitoa i te hunga pākeke ki te poa. Matariki draws the frail into the endless night. And because of the association with the dead, but during its rise in the winter, usually the owl, the the uh, more frail, would pass away. And so Matariki was there to take them and look after them. So that role of guiding us, I think is really, really important. Uh, I want to head to the work of Mahui and Murphy. Some of you might be with, with familiar. She did, she wrote books, she did a PhD on reclaiming of uh, traditional Māori ways with menstruation. And, and she came and did a project with me and a group of our friends at Māori Women's Art Collective. And she had this understanding, this belief that those of us who did art about particular atua, particular gods, spoke to those gods through that art and our gods were able to speak through us and i was absolutely obsessed with this idea because it's such it makes so much sense you know for those of us who maybe come from cultures or who are Māori and other cultures who have a strong connection with the dead with those who have passed that through that connection that long after they've gone they continue to guide us and so i thought through the connection we make we enable more of our guides, more of our gods and spiritual beings uh, to guide us, to be a normal part of our lives. And so I was thinking, what does that mean then for Tapatakui and how we allow Matariki as it becomes more widely known, as more people connect to it, then our relationship with those stars, with those gods, then are able to enhance and improve our lives. So we're going to pass it over to our first speaker and I'll let you introduce your own self and also thank you for your karakia and for welcoming us here today. Uh, kia ora. Kia ora. Oh, did I introduce myself? <laughs> Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Say <laughs> 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 so right, your name. <laughs> And on the side of my mother, come from Ireland, from County Clare and County Tipperary. Uh, I am the Green Party MP. Uh, I've dedicated my life to Takapapui for a long, long time. And being a part of our rainbow communities, always with the goal that we can always be ourselves in a way that uplifts the cultures, the languages, the spiritualities we bring from our ancestors, but also the way that we express ourselves and regardless and because of and celebration of our diversity, the sexualities and sex characteristics. So this is part of continuing the conversation in this, in this place and on this clip of secured. Kia ora tātou, ko Jess McLean tōku inoa, ko Ngāti Kahu, ko Ngāti Hini, ko Clan O'Hara, rātou ko Clan McLean o ko iwi. Um, lovely to be here and so great to see people in the room and people online. Um, the, the provocation for our recording all today was, was what does Matariki mean to, to you or to, to us as individuals? And I should emphasise a really cool point Elizabeth made, which was that as Takatapui, it's not necessarily that we apply a gender and sexuality lens to everything, but that as Takatapui, the views that we have on things are Takatapui views. 
Um, in saying that, I will engage a little bit with um, the decolonial possibilities of something like Matariki. Um, but I want to start actually by reading the first bit of a piece by the staunchest, awesome Wahine uh, Wanita Hippie. Some of you may be familiar with her. She's uh, big in, in the art scene. She also works here at UC and she wrote a creative piece called Matariki is not a pack and save special. I'm not <laughs> going to read the whole thing out, but honestly, it's so cool and mind blowing. Um, come up to me afterwards if you want me to tell you where you can find it. Um, or Google Matariki is not a pack and save special. And so I should also mention Juanita is Whakapapa Sin Laitahu, um, and our Whakapapa to the far north and to the South Island is relevant to this Matariki discussion. Juanita says, or writes, Kea te pō te tima takamai, o te waia te takamai, o te atua. In the beginning, it was in the night that the gods sang the world into existence. Te kore, te pō, te ao, Three stages, all turning from nothing to darkness to light, prenatal, fetal birth, from the unions of water, heat, darkness, light, sound, energy, and fury came Ashwa who oversee us divinely, but they are fallible. We know that they're not anthropomorphic beings looking down on us from high. We know they're not he or she, or him or her, there's no gifts of Mur or sacred scripture, no Shiva, no Zarathustra, no Aeon, Atua, Atua. I want to leave with that because it had a big impact on me, but also sparked off all of the thoughts, some of which I'm about to share with you. Later in the piece, Juanita alludes to the fact that Matariki is not universally recognised amongst Māori as the herald of the new year. This isn't to take a pot shot at Matariki. I should say first and foremost that one of the things Matariki means to me is the reinvigoration of our knowledges and our practices, of the integration of that with the more kind of mainstream. So of course I'm broadly supportive of that, but whakapapuring to the far north, we're puanga people. There's, a, there's another star which was commonly used like Whanganui, Taranaki, parts of the far north and parts of Te Waipaunau look to Puanga, or Puaka as they call it down here. What's the relevance to Takatapui? My concern is around a homogenization of Māori culture and identity that renders us invisible. You know, when settlers arrived, they brought with them a particular worldview, which is harmful to Takatapui and which has over time been internalised by parts of our communities through the process of colonisation. And so when the kind of a monolithic version of being Māori is presented, as Takatāpa, we're not in that picture, or at least we haven't been in that picture um, for a long time. And so I want to mahi to Elizabeth for producing the most extensive a piece of research into this to date. Later on in Juanita's piece, she quotes Tatepani, um, and your quoted or just made me think of it. She said that Tatepani said, the more I learn about myself, the more I am myself. And I think that for me, Matariki is an opportunity to consider my own identity as Māori, um, how that may connect with, with other Takatāpui. There's no one right or wrong way um, to be Takatāpui. So what does Matariki mean to me? I hope it means opening a space for the diversity of Māori oral traditions and practices um, to begin to emerge. If Matariki can lead the way for us, then maybe Kuanga will follow. And maybe we will begin to see more of the celebration of um, the diversity that, that exists within the Māori community. And so that was pretty much my thinking on it. You know, I'm heartened that we have a now a public holiday that as Māori we can share with, 
with the country, wary of the commodification of it, as Juanita alludes to in the title of her Matariki is not a pack and say special thing, um, but also wanting to, how to put it, without swearing, <laughs> um, <laughs> wanting to uphold the mana of Matariki, but alongside that of Puanga and other Atua um, and knowledges. So that was, that's what I'm going to kind of put on the table for consideration. I'd really rather listen to what you all have to say than talk on too long myself. So I think I might leave it here for now, but return to you, Elizabeth, or should we pass to our... Yes. Cool. In that case, kia ora, Siobhan. Nice, nice to see you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to metaphorically um, pass the mic over to you and uh, let you introduce yourself. Kia ora, Hoa. Uh, kia ora koutou, um, ko Siobhan Tuku Ingoa, uh, he uriaho no Waikato Tainui. I'm actually currently in uh, Tamaki Makoto, uh, thanks to the art gallery for the free Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> uh, usually I live in Ototahi, so I'm kind of sad that I'm missing the opportunity to be here. Um, I mean, you could have waited till tomorrow, but that's all good. Um, <laughs> um, when I was asked to be on this panel, I was like very surprised, but like feeling very grateful. Thank you so much. Um, I think I've sort of had lots of korero with my partner, Kai, about um, matariki and also pride, because obviously those two are sort of around the same time, um, well, at the moment, and I guess kind of usually during the year. Um, and it's the strange intersect of um, thinking about us as takatapui within um, a Māori tanga and then takatapui in a pride sense. And I feel like those two images are different and that's because in Te Ao Māori, uh, I guess pre-colonisation, takatāpui tanga wasn't celebrated as such because it was an everyday thing. And it wasn't something that we had to remember people who had fought for that right because it was our right as he tangata Māori within our hapu and with our, within our whānau to express ourselves in however we did. Because as young children in Te Ao Māori, you are seen and valued for the attributes that you show when you are growing. And so you would be assigned tasks or life pathways due to your personality. And I think that we kind of don't honour that in our sort of like everyday uh, te ao huri huri lives, you know, when we're both walking in te ao Māori and te ao Pākehā, because while they do intersect in many ways, that's like no surprise that uh, te ao Pākehā has really formed the way that we see gender, gender roles, sexualities, and we're still seeing those uh, influences now. I mean, not to bring up some, oh, yeah, I will bring up some awful things that have just happened recently with some of our pride and rainbow um, organizations that have been vandalized. And that is coming particularly from a uh, harmful mindset that comes from a colonizer and colonized view that uh, of homophobia, of transphobia, and those overarching uh, colonial patriarchal ideals of what is correct and what's the right way to live. And so I guess for me, being takatapui during Matariki and also takatapui during Pride, it's really a time for me to really sit down and think like, where do I fit in this world? How can I take the learnings from our atua 
and from our Purako and from the oral histories of our uh, hapu, of our iwi. Um, and all of the whakatoki, the waiata that come into our lives and implement that so that I'm not perpetuating the same colonized understandings of gender and sexuality because that's what decolonizing gender and sexuality looks like for me is trying to move closer to understanding my whakapapa, understanding the stories of my people and understanding that as you elucidated Jess, bringing the colonized ideologies um, into our lives and really trying to force us to conform to something that doesn't work for us as a people. Um, I really loved uh, the writing that you read out, Jess, from um, Juanita, who of course is a beautiful human. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I hadn't actually heard of that before, and so now I'm gonna go and find it. I don't have any books with me at the moment, but I think that there are plenty of resources online that you can um, find more information about um, Takatapuitanga. Um, I know Elizabeth has plenty on uh, <laughs> available. Um, I think that I've really moved towards uh, like healing mindset as well and healing those old wounds. I've myself have been um, going through midi midi sessions and that's bringing up a lot of that sucker papa um, harm that's happened. And that's literally through the colonization harm. I fuck papa to Rangiriri, which there was a war um, at the pa there. And like I was watching the documentary and just crying because that's my it's my tupuna and we had to fight and uh for our sovereignty and like we're still fighting for our sovereignty just not in wars it's the wars of ideologies now so yeah that was a really big portal. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for listening um i i guess i the last thing I want to say is that um, I know that pride is like a really big party time for a lot of people, but it's totally okay to not do that. It's totally okay to read uh, books by queer or takatapui um, authors or um, read books about queer or takatapui people. It's okay to visit your whanau. It's okay to have gentle conversations watch movies on the couch, um, you know, there's plenty of queer movies. Netflix has heaps of queer movies now, which is so great. Um, but yeah, thanks. <laughs> Kia ora. Thank you so much. I love that. And it, it fits in really well. <clears throat> One of the things with Matariki, uh, another whakatoki, is Matariki Hunga Nui, which means Matariki of many people. And so during Matsuriki festivities, because that's where people fested, and there was always plenty, uh, that people would gather get together to celebrate the passing of one year and the hope of a new one. So the gathering of people is a core part of Matsuriki. And so again, to reinforce how important it is to be around the people that you love, that uh, help you be who you are, uh, but also who are fun, who make you laugh, uh, who make you think, uh, but and also who make you feel safe. Because no matter what we do and the jobs we all have, the lives that we all lead, uh, sometimes you just have to have that haven. And hopefully that's in your home, uh, but hopefully it's also in your workplace, in your communities, in the place for you, uh, and the places of worship that you might be in. And so I'm <clears throat> going to open it. Uh, I did want to just mention about coming up with what you said about those the gendering of all of our arts work. Because every time when I speak at things, I always have a Komato come and speak to me about different, especially spiritual beings who were not male or female, who they would say that they're, they're 
not either there all of it and and I've always wanted to know more about that it's because around the world Matariki is celebrated different cultures have different things and almost all the stories Matariki is female and seen as the mother or the other sister uh, and in most cases the rest of the atua or the other stars around here are also female so they talk about the seven sisters the Pleiades for example uh, so for us one of the corridor is that there are eight children and five of them were female and three were male uh, because three sets of those there's kind of the eldest words kawa the youngest hiwai perangi uh, and then there's the ones kind of in the middle match and so there's waiti waita so they always had one female one male waipunarangi and let me check this one waipunarangi and ururangi so again okay, female male and tupuaruku tupuarangi and so those those names feature in other moteati and other waiata about our people and so i'm always interested and how do we cast a takatakui lens then, perhaps on how that's interpreted? Uh, are they, is it, does it always have to be binary? And I feel like it doesn't, because I don't believe it always was. Mm. That the naming of all that atua became very binary by the time other people are recording our stories, because that is the only framework that they had. And so it's really important sometimes to be able to go back into the past and read some of the original Māori manuscripts of our first writers and to get those stories. So that's of course where the main Tapatapui came from. The very first text that was written in Te Reo uh, by Te Rangi Kaheke. Uh, and, and that's certainly where the, the basis of my research has been to go and be a detective and to find the things that sometimes are hidden and I feel that matariki, as it becomes increasingly clearer to all of us, to the point that we actually have a national holiday, the first Indigenous holiday in this country, uh, that there's so much more for us to for them to tell us. So I want to throw open to um, to the floor and to you online. If uh, if you're online, there's a Q and A thingy. Uh, so put some questions in there, and they'll be called out to us. But also um in in the room so it doesn't have to be a question just your musings things you've thought about things that you've reflected from our people talking and to all have maybe kerry can run the mic to you just so we can hear a better oh presley a friend you can like there's some questions comments Uh, um, every year during February and March, you always see, you know, like you were saying before, like you want to find new people that you want to hang out with. And I guess with Tapatapu, it is, you know, you do gravitate towards the pride, like the rainbow community in Ozzero, if that makes sense, it's safe. Um, but every year you hear Tapatapu saying, these places aren't for us, that we feel unsafe. And so I just wanted to know your guys' thoughts on like, do you think it's a matter of decolonizing those spaces or creating new spaces, making space? Like, do you think there's a solution there? Because I don't know, you hear it every year and I just feel like they get ignored every year because people don't know the solution. People don't know the history of it. I'll start off with that and then see about the speakers want to respond. I think it's both of the things, all of the things, because sometimes <clears throat> we're at different stages of who we are as Takapapui. Sometimes we've heard the word for the first time and some of us don't feel Māori enough to claim it. We don't feel queer enough to claim it. And so when you're in that place then sometimes even going into a takapa this space can feel intimidating because everyone seems so strong and so confident and i'm not quite sure where i am at, at, with this and, and so in that case it, it's a place of privilege and and we all have to be aware that not everyone is in the same place as us 
and, and, and it's a different level of inclusivity to say we are all this thing, we all belong here, but some of us at a different stage in the journey. The other thing is there are many groups, and, and over the years I've had many organisations come to me and say, how can we get more Māori into, and this is across any sector, including in rainbow sectors, how do we get more Māori in? Okay, the easiest part is to have, have helping, having Māori helping run things that they're already involved in setting something up. Because if you've done all the thinking, you've done all the organising, you've got a venue, and then you put out a notice to say, hey, we'd like you all to come. I'm like, now it's tricky. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same thing if you say, oh, a whole lot of older people set something up, and then go, we'd like to do things for young people. Yeah. And we do all the work, and then go, oh, I don't know why the young people don't come. <laughs> no, it's just easier if you do that organising with together. We say, what are the different things to think of? How do we do something simple? Uh, <clears throat> it's the same thing. Even in even our party, we're getting people used to the idea of uh, just giving our pronouns. And I realise that the I'm used to being on Zoom and my pronouns are beside my name. Uh, so I use he, she, and ear as my tikopa. Uh, but even that simple thing of in a meeting, everyone choose their pronouns so that even if you know you're all cis, so that when someone who is non-binary, who comes into the space, I think, oh, these people know a little bit what's what. And it's, a, it's not even the last resort, but the other option is, yeah, start your own thing. Just say, this is the particular type of thing I need right now. I'll find a couple of mates and we'll just do it. We are renowned, I think, across New Zealand for our youth leadership in this space creating spaces everywhere uh, just to help look after each other and oh, avoid going into all of the systemic and institutional homophobia, transphobia, antiphobia, and biphobia that is, saturates all parts of our system, <laughs> which means that volunteers and predominantly young people have to create their own safe spaces in the absence of a system that does not provide them. Uh, <clears throat> just, you know, we're working on it. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, again, have fun and keep ourselves safe. Sometimes we just have to do it ourselves. And but there is an aspect where if this happens year after year after year, then that means there's something systemic inside our own rainbow communities. And it just needs to be faced and say, look, let's have a hoi, let's do a thing. What would it look like if we start again? What do we need to do? Can we do it and do it together? Because every time you're still create, trying to create something and the people in the room don't have the lived experience of what you're trying to include, it cannot work. It just can't. It will, I mean, it will work to some degree, but it won't work to the degree it needs to or could potentially amazingly work. Yeah. Do you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, kia ora. That was an awesome question. And what came to, to my mind is that what I think a lot of non takatapa we don't understand is that takatapa is not simply a, a way of identifying oneself in terms of gender and sexuality, but it's in fact founded in a Māori identity. And so I think that it's that intersection of gender and sexuality characteristics with ethnicity that um, gets lost in the mainstream spaces. And I'm actually talking Māori mainstream spaces here as well, you know. Um, and so my where I'm at at the moment is that I think there is definitely a space for um, dedicated takatapui engagement because we're not there yet. And I think that um, cultivating within ourselves the qualities and the expertise that we will need is, is going to be really important. So I think it's an excellent question and there's no one right or wrong answer, but I'm, I'm team Takatawa, we need its own thing sometimes. <laughs> um, Siobhan, did you have any comments you'd like to make in response to this part I? Yeah, um, I think on a practical level in terms of uh, organisations um, making space for Takatawa, it's kind of, a, there's like a big gap in Ōtautahi especially um, because while there is a Takatapui, um like charity organisation called Kahukura Ponamu, 
there's no one that's activated that as a real hub for uh, Takatapui in um, Ōtautahi. And I saw that um, what used to be the New Zealand AIDS Foundation, I'm not sure what it's called now, they have currently got funding um, to give out to Takatapui individuals, organisations, to um, create Takatapui space or artwork. And I mean, if anyone wants to have a portido, I'd be so happy to be on creating something because my sort of like work background is in community spaces and youth work. So hit me up. <laughs> but um, I also think that um, as a Takatapui person going to university, which is a very privileged act and something I was able to do because I had support, um, we just won't look at the student loan. <laughs> but um, going into university, I found was there was safer places. I'm not going to say the safest places, but safer spaces for me as Takatapui to be. And I, I'm not sure why that is, but I know that Q Canterbury kind of does what it can. But I really found my space in Aotahi. Um, because people there are lovely and it's just whānau, you know. Um, but if you can't go afford to take any of the courses at uni, just go hang out at Aotahi. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so I think the space is wanting to be activated and wanting somebody or an organisation the right organisation, I should say, and it needs to be Takatapui led um, to be creating those safer options and safer spaces for Takatapui Māori. Just to what Shabon was saying about organisations that can help with things like creating safe spaces. I work in health, primary health, um, and Pegasus Health already does things like transgender package of care, which made a huge difference for transgender patients. And they, that's one organisation that I believe would be worth linking with. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Kilda. Kilda. Oh, yes. Kia ora mai tātou. Taku māre kura, kei te miha tu kia koe. Aku haumi, kia ora. My name's Kairi Moana. Um, I just had a couple of points, kia ora, shabon. I had a couple of points to make, um, and they're not really questions, but that's what I do, so sorry. <laughs> um, a couple of points. My first one really is... Um, I didn't know what this was going to be today, but I saw um, the names and all that. That's cool, peeps. I'm going to go and have a listen. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to make a couple of points before. The first one really is around um, identity. And we have multiple layers of identity, and it's which one is at the heart, I guess, for us. Um, and that sometimes for me makes a big difference in the way we engage with spaces. Um, so for me, um, absolutely, he takatapui a hau. Um, that's my identity marker because kutoku ao kia Māori. So my world is a Māori world. Um, the, the queer, the LGBT, the rainbow space is not a space that um, I'm in a lot, to be honest, because my ao Māori is a safe space for me as a takatapui. And I know I'm very privileged. Um, and I know not all Māori spaces are safe. Um, but the spaces that I'm in, I feel safe in those spaces to be takatapui. Um, and I recognise the incredible privilege, but um, I just wanted to acknowledge that, that not all people that are takatapui necessarily feel comfortable in other spaces and vice versa. Mm. And I'm very conscious, sorry, I lecture in um, our Māori kind of things <laughs> here at the UC. Um, I'm also really quite cautious about people using takatapui um, as a term interchangeably with queer and other kupu because for me takatapui means something really different um, and 
the Matariki thing, I'm gonna bring it back to Matariki because I'm a moon and a star geek is my is my passion. Um, I love that people are learning about Matariki. What scares me is the commercialization of Matara and Maori. Um, what scares me is the homogenization of our stories. Um, what scares me is that they're taken and not just appreciated but appropriated. Um, and sometimes in the future that my grandkids might hear those stories and they don't belong to them anymore is my, sorry, I don't know, I'm nervous. <laughs> I can talk to hundreds and not be nervous, um, is, is my concern. So um, the gender thing, I think, also feels uncomfortable for me as someone who grew up, grew up hearing these pūraka and always has felt uncomfortable. Um, I don't see the need for it. Um, Rangi's a really awesome person and I've um, been lucky to spend a lot of time with him, but that's our narrative, yeah. So what worries me is that we take our narrative and that becomes a dark narrative. Um, and all of a sudden we think wind and warfare is a male thing um, and seawater for some reason is male and um, Fresh water is female, the, the ground is female, the, the sky is male. Um, that's not Māori. Um, and I think that by taking a little bit and making it a single narrative, sometimes we lose, or always, we lose the richness of that kōrero. We all have elements of ku and of hina inside all of us. Um, my my wife is Hawaiian and is in Hawaii at the moment, so they talk about mahu, and they talk about everybody has ku, which is a more masculine energy, and hina, which is a more feminine energy, um, and it's in different states in the balance, um, and I love that. So I think in terms of um, tupuanaku, tupuarangi, waiti, waitao, and matariki elements, there's elements in the ocean that sometimes um, to me feels more masculine and there's elements in the ocean that absolutely feel feminine. So um, that concerns me about the homogenization and the um, allocation of gender to Matariki because I never grew up hearing that and when it became public I thought awesome and then I saw pictures and there were boys and girls and I thought oh why do we have to go there? Why can't it just connect to the taiao and we leave it at that? So sorry, not even a question, Jess. Um, <laughs> don't invite me back. <laughs> we are I don't know if everybody on Zoom could hear all of that. I'm not even going to try and paraphrase that, but I suggest if you could not hear that, when you go back and read the, listen to the recording, uh, it was very beautiful. Kia ora. Mm. Did you catch that your phone? Sure. And just a response to that, I remember when I was at school thinking pretty much the same thing about gender because we were taught the roles of Matariki were given to um ah, what's the word? Um show that whatever gender the say the ocean or the ground were given, that it was because of gender roles with men or the male being more powerful and feminine being weaker. And <laughs> so when I heard that I was the exact same thing because I remember being a wee queer child being like, but I can do what they can do as well, I'm kind of just being taught um, that from a young age, from also Pākehā teachers as well, it was quite difficult for me because I think in that space you kind of believe that as a kid because your teachers are teaching you what you need to know, but I just, um, I'm actually a primary school teacher now myself and I was wondering what the best way of me, um, not only as a teacher but also as a Pākehā woman, how I can teach that in a way that doesn't take away from um, Māori and actually um, influences children and family to learn more about it without my own biases as that. Mm. If that makes sense. <laughs> Do you want to start with this one? Awesome. Kilda, uh, in case you could not hear, so a question from a primary school teacher saying how do we talk about these issues and things with our kids um, but with as a part here how do we make sure that we don't undermine Māpaurana Māori and those I think my number one piece of advice is when when I moved home back to Gisborne 
and I was at Toi Hokura Māori Art School there. Every single day we started with more te and karakia. It was a blissful three years for that reason. Uh, however, we were taught, say where you got your knowledge from. So you say, as you say, it's our story, is this story that, that Mani Mato Tamo talks about. However, here's this other person says, it's a slightly different story. So it's never your story. It's never that story. Mm -hmm. But just say, this is where I got this information. This is where I learned this. And so I want you to know these different versions of it. And so it allows them to not get trapped into, this is the right one, everything else must be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, might be the one that's the most common. But hey, here's something cool. Mm -hmm. These people over here say this story. And then they all, if they learn those stories together, then they see the um, the nuance in it, the possibilities in it. And if you're a queer child seeing those, then you see yourself reflect in it. That is a beautiful thing. Kia ora. I just want to, um, to Kari, and to you. Um, and I guess what I was thinking when you were both talking was um, it's even from a, even if we just think it through, it doesn't make sense that a metaphysical being, a cosmological principle, would possess a binary gender, which is found here in the mortal world, you know. And then when you look at the linguistic clues for the fact that Te Reo Māori has no gendered pronouns, suggests to us that not too much importance could have been placed on it, because if it was important, then you would need to differentiate. We do have words that differentiate familial relationships, because those were important. Um, and so when we're thinking about our atua, we think gender neutral pronouns, we think gender neutral names, um, it becomes a, a decision as to how, you know, if we're going to gender these beings and that decision is, is kind of made neutrally, you know, and so does much to hear the gender, I mean, how, I don't, to me, I don't see how it, could and it's just to me to your sensitive question around how to kind of deliver the stuff that's exactly the kind of question that makes my heart sing and I would just total call Elizabeth's comments in that regard that as Kari mentioned you know we, we, don't, we don't want the homogenization of Māori culture and so rather than saying this is the story this is a story this is where this story comes from and then with the accumulation of enough stories people can kind of Kind of build their own pictures. Um, Siobhan, did you want to make any comments in response to our, what we've just been talking about? I think um, we kind of have to be careful when we're speaking about tamariki, um, Māori who are in school who may not have access to these pūrāko as well. So sometimes their only source of um, any te ao Māori mātauranga comes from school. So I think it is really important that we are talking about and teaching our tamariki about Māori culture because of the disconnect that some of us as urban Māori may face. Um, but I, I guess it is just making sure that the narratives are not, um, I think we have this, tendency to create them into like a fantastical, mythical story when actually they were like life principles and, and teachings that were in those purako. So um, yeah, I, that's all I am kind of thinking out of that is sometimes our tamariki can only access their mātauranga Māori through a school place because of urbanisation and yeah. I think that's a really important part of teaching. I don't know if that has helped in any way, but <laughs> Kia ora. Kia ora. Oh, I might stand up I don't know if you can see me at the front, but um, kia ora, ko Grace, ko Kuriwa, huria hau no te api hau nei ato parangi me ngā te rangi huki. Um, I just wanted to sort of add a dimension to the koreo about the commodification and kind of 
parkification, I suppose, of Motiliki and of Pride. Um, it might turn into a pathway or it might just be a ramble, we'll see. <laughs> but um, I think on that corridor about commodification, something I've noticed which concerns me a little bit is the celebration of Matariki being marked in ways that are damaging to Te Taiao and to the environment, sorry. Sure. Um, and which kind of take away from focusing on the stars. So things like fireworks, which cause noise and light pollution and obviously add plastics to the ocean and light shows and all of those kind of things. They seem to distract from the fact that Matariki is about connecting with Papa Tuanaku and with Te Taiao and kind of turn it into a more urban Pākehā concerning Kōrero. And then there is that dimension maybe with pride about rainbow capitalism, commodification of pride. So I just wanted to be a new Fakaro on that and just wanted to add that to the Kōrero. Uh, just to say I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it makes me think of the way that Air New Zealand put a kōru on their aeroplane when until 2017 they would not employ a person with a moho. Mm -hmm. You know, wow. Yeah, absolutely concerned <laughs> about the um, potential for commodification. And I guess that's sort of the risk. I can, I can understand why some people might feel that they wouldn't want Matariki to be a publicly celebrated public holiday for, for the reasons that, um, that you talk about. Um, yeah, so I guess I also agree. <laughs> Siobhan? Totoko. <laughs> well, I think we have time for one more question. Kia ora. Um, my name is Mariah Aroha. I'm from Tuahiwi and I don't have a question, but more just like a food for thought kind of. Um, so an issue that I find with this uh, this colonised world, this urbanised world, this institutionalised world that we're kind of born into and expected to follow, it's you find one person that you that has the opposite genitals to you because that's important apparently and then you build a life with them and you stay within one home with them mm. and it's just you and them and your children that is so separating like you it's it does not leave room for connection and uh like to be queer to be tough tough or you uh, to be a human, I reckon we need so much connection with other, with multiple people in our lives. We we need that love and communities of love. I don't want to find belonging in an institution or an organisation. I want to find belonging <clears throat> in the people that I share my life with. Uh, so, like, I reckon, safe place or not, I'm gonna aggressively be myself and aggressively be myself with Aroha. Um, and I would encourage other people to do that too. Um, like we have to make the norm uh, accept us. Can I call it all to this a little bit? Um, <clears throat> I totoko, what you say. I don't think we need to make the norm accept us because we don't really need accepting. <laughs> but I think um, what I can hear from you is that you want to sort of be the change that you want to see in the world. Is that correct? I can't see you, but... <laughs> <laughs> be nodding. Okay. okay. Um, and I, there's lots of people out there who are living multi-generationally and um, sharing resources and houses and spaces with um, whānau and community. So myself and my partner 
live with our very good friend Audrey and we all share resources and we raise our 12 year old boy in that environment at the moment he's a boy so that's him but um we are definitely not a conventional conventional parkia way of um a whanau but we are a whanau with our little cat <laughs> um and it works really well because we share vehicles, we share food, we share all the um, responsibilities of the whanau, and we really enjoy it. Um, so I, I definitely total for you to say, you know, um, build those whanau and those community and living situations if you can, because man, rent is so expensive. Yeah. Um, and three adults is kind of better than two <laughs> when you're paying for those things. But um, I definitely say, go forth and um, live with others and make sure that you're kind to each other because we're all on a, you know, all on a decolonizing journey um, because colonization is very violent and has created this very um, individualistic ideology that we must have success in these very specific ways. But I think success is a bit of a farce so um yeah just go and go and live with your friends raise kids together like build a garden and um, make an apocalypse clan you know <laughs> that's what we're doing <laughs> Uh, and I think what you, the last thing that you said, Siobhan, just bringing it back to Matariki to close, is build a garden. The closer we are to the thing, like the healthier we are, whether that's how we eat, that's knowing who we are and, and being grounded, like literally connecting to the whenua that we stand on, that we live on. And, and I think change has to happen on so many different levels and so many different places. I've got to that stage in my life that now I'm looking to make change in Parliament and we have to learn how these things work. And when, not long after I started, friends of mine said, how can you, uh, how can you stand for being in this place? It's like the bastion of colonisation. Mm -hmm. And it's like two things. One, if we are not subverting every single day, we're colluding with what this place stands for. So I'm very conscious every single day what I'm doing in that place. But number two, I said, I'm coming here to take over. <laughs> I will make a space for the Tapui in this place. And I'm not, not by no means the first Tapui there. I'm certainly the first that, that right, drives every single thing I do and say. And so, again, it's wherever we feel comfortable, wherever we find ourselves in, is to make it a space that others can come safely into and be a place to have these conversations, to keep thinking, and to know we're allowed to have fun. We're allowed <laughs> to just get on with our life and, and be who we need to be, and it shouldn't be a trial. We shouldn't get hurt for doing that. And so I'm going to hand it to Jess to close. But I will shout out to our whanau up in Tauranga, who's uh, the Rainbow Youth Centre that got beat down, mm. the ones in Bethlehem School who are suffering um, discrimination in this, across schools in this country, but also every single thing that people in our communities and our whanau people out there are doing to create safe spaces, to make the world better. Our allies who are stepping out to say, you know what, that joke's not funny. And you do not talk like that in front of me anymore. So everything we do contributes. My, as part of my work, I created a framework called the Whare Takatapua House of Wellbeing. Uh, for the Katapui, where we could welcome people of all cultures uh, to uh, in this conceptual space. And I, and I always believe that every time we do this, 
we help rebuild that house. We carve those whakaido on the walls. We weave the tipu panels and we paint those core whakai together to create that house and make it unbreakable. And so one fight might have burned out and we've rebuilt it. As community, we'll get in behind and we'll make sure that happens. But we all are part of that for ourselves, for our family and in our community. I just want to thank you for being here today and being part of this, all of you online. And I'm going to pass it to Jesus to us. Kia ora. I'm going to pass it back to you because you're going to plug the Rainbow Ministry petition. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> It was written down. <laughs> <laughs> there is a petition. I can go on to the Australians, uh, for ministry, because we think in Parliament that it's a uh, we need a, an actual specific embedded place that coordinates all the work because these little bits, little pockets, you know, little bits of money that came out in the last budget uh, and pay order that they talked about. Um, funds for intersex people and guidelines for health professionals, finally, uh, but also the first of its kind in the world, and actually national budget is, which is unbelievable, uh, but more resourcing for gender affirming path, uh, pathways uh, for trans non binary people. Uh, but conversion practices and everything that falls out from that, uh, the there's death and marriages relationship register, which enables our trans family to uh, uh, change their birth certificate. There's all these different little pockets of things. They're not coordinated, and we need that. So yes, that is the plug. So now petition we're going to revamp that and bring it out again. But um, and this time <laughs> we're closing. So <laughs> 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 kia ora. Kia ora, Elizabeth. Well, big mahi to um, everyone that's attending online and that's here in the room. I mean, without you all, there is no point to these things. And so thank you uh, for braving the weather or making the time for us. Some acknowledgements to Rosalie um, and Kitty, who have been instrumental in arranging this. Um, Shout out to Karen Murphy, the Altahi administrator. I can't see her, but she's also been instrumental in uh, putting this all together. Thank you to my fellow panelists, Siobhan, lovely to see you, and you, Elizabeth. Um, we will close with a karakia, and then I believe Elizabeth has about 10 or 15 minutes to sort of mingle and call it all. Um, so, thank you all. Mino tato. Unuhia, unuhia. Ono hia ki te uru takunui, ki a wātia, ki a māma, te ngākau, te tinana, te wairua, i te ara takatū. Koe a rā i rongo, whakaira, whakairia, ake ki runga, ki a tina, tina. hui e tāi ki e. Kia ora tātou. That's us, everybody.